Thank you very much, Chris. Um, lovely to be back. Um, today I'm going to tell you a little story. Before I do this, though, I just want to say a couple words about the lab that I run at SFU. We used to be called the Tropical Marine Ecology Lab, but because we work in temperate regions, um, well, some students objected. So just to keep the same acronym, we're now the Marine Ecology Lab, which is the same. Um, but about two-thirds of the work that we do is in uh, tropical uh, climes, on coral reefs in particular, but about a third of it is done locally. And in general, the, we kind of concentrate on three things, trying to reconstruct patterns of ecological change in the sea, especially in coastal areas, um, looking at marine protected, uh, marine protected areas, their effectiveness, how we can make them better, and marine invasions, which is the part um, of our program that I'm going to talk about today. So, as I said, I'm going to tell you a story, a story about a fish that got placed in a place where it shouldn't have been put. Um, just to give you a bit of context, uh, I'll tell you about invasions um, in the marine realm, and then we'll focus on the bad guy of today, which is the lionfish. And I, I'll cover what we've done so far, which has focused largely on documenting their direct impacts and looking at uh, their management and how we can control them. And then um, we'll look a little bit at what we're doing right now, which is kind of result-free but ideas-rich, uh, which is more stuff about management and looking now at indirect impacts. Um, now, marine invaders, as you probably know, are found everywhere. This is a, a global map that shows the distribution of marine invading species in coastal areas. And you can see there's some parts of the world that are bright red. Red is bad. You might think that white is good because that's the other end of the spectrum. But in fact, white doesn't mean no invaders. White means no data. So as soon as we fill these um, white places with data, it's undoubtedly the case that they'll all be of some color. But we've got lots of marine invaders everywhere in the ocean. And marine invasions um, are started by three typical vectors. Um, invaders are introduced through ballast water. They're also introduced via agriculture, um, coming in or hitchhiking on the back of things like oysters, which is one of the main um, vectors in aquaculture. But the vector that is of interest to us today is the aquarium trade. This is how lionfish got transported from the Indo-Pacific to the Atlantic. Um, just to get a picture to situate the lionfish, which obviously is a fish, in the grand scheme of who marine invaders are, here you've got the, um, the proportion of all species in the large database held of marine invaders. And you can see that crustaceans, algae, and mollusks tend to make up the bulk of marine invaders. Fish are relatively rare, not very many um, fish invaders. Lionfish, as you'll find out soon, are also predators. So if we sort of narrow this down onto predatory fish, then the list of precedents to lionfish becomes even smaller. In fact, it's limited to probably fewer fingers than I have on my hand. And three of these species um, are found in Hawaii. Um, so the peacock group here, the blue line snapper, and there's another snapper that's not depicted here, are two, well, these are two species that now probably make up the, most of the biomass on Hawaiian reefs. These are Indo-Pacific species, um, but they're not native to Hawaii. And about 50 or 60 years ago, they were transported from French Polynesia onto Hawaiian reefs because people at the time felt that there was a gap um, in the food chain. <laughs> they weren't quite enough of these meso predators, so obviously the, the right thing to do was to put some more. They were also supposed to enhance fisheries. Um, well, peacock grouper and blue line snapper really like Hawaiian reefs. Actually, this bottom picture down here of blue line snapper, I took that on a reef in Hawaii. So you will see very, very large schools. In the past uh, five or 
six years, there's been some effort into trying to understand the ecological impact of these um, meso predators on Hawaiian reefs, but I would argue that these studies are really coming about 50 years too late. The impact that these species have had, they've had a long time ago, and um, it's really not possible to detect their impact now. And that brings us to lionfish. Um, we talk about lionfish as if it was one species, but in fact, it's two species. We're talking about the red lionfish, Pterois volitans, which is distributed across the Pacific, as well as the common lionfish, Pterois miles, which is uh, distributed through the Indian Ocean. So all the area with the red dots, that's the native distribution of these two species. They're very, very similar. Um, in fact, if you just look at them, unless you start counting sort of fin rays and, and gill rakers and things like that, you can't really tell them apart. They are genetically distinct though, but for practical purposes we just lump them together. Um, we do know though that Pteros volitans is the most abundant one in the range. So here's a map. You're going to see that the, um, the date is going to move and things start in Florida. I don't speak quite fast enough to keep up with this map, but it's going to turn around again. So for about 10 years or so, lionfish was um, found off the coast of Florida, largely, we think, through introductions by aquarium keepers, who probably realized lionfish grow really big, eat everything in the tank, and that's bad. 2004, they made the jump to the Bahamas, and you can see that very quickly, from that point where they encountered coral reefs, they spread fast around the Caribbean Sea into the Gulf of Mexico, and I think the map ends in about 2013. Um, since then, they've basically been busily filling all the gaps in distribution. And about six months ago, they were found on the coast of Brazil. So they managed to cross the Orinoco um, barrier, and undoubtedly, they're gonna make their way down that coast as well. So they are everywhere. They're everywhere geographically like this, they're also everywhere in terms of habitats. So we find them uh, on coral reefs, we find them on in mangroves, we find them in seagrass, we find them basically in any kind of habitat where we run something solid that gives structure. So all those boat engines and those tires and those bits of rubbish that people have been throwing in the sea are a haven for lionfish. They just kind of agglomerate around those. They're found from about one meter deep to more than a hundred meters deep. They're literally absolutely everywhere. Now if you were to design an invader of a fish, you'd probably design something like a lionfish. It's got a bunch of different characteristics that are Superb, if you want to design an invader. Um, let's start with their body size. They're pretty large, uh, up to 50 centimeters, which then means that they can eat a large range of things. They have a generalist diet. Um, they can eat things that are almost up to half their size. They, um, they have a relatively cryptic coloration. They're also venomous, so their dorsal spines and their anal spines um, are venomous, which means they're, they don't have very, very many natural predators. They're prolific breeders, so they mature at about six months of age, 10 centimeters roughly in size, and under good conditions, such as the conditions you find close to the equator, where the temperature is warm all the time, females will breed about every four days through the year. They release not that many eggs, just a few thousand, as opposed to millions <laughs> like a cod, but every four days. The eggs are buoyant, fertilization occurs in the water. The eggs are then carried in a mass of jelly that a lot of people think is probably unpalatable. And they stay in the plankton for about 25 days, which gives them the scope really to disperse quite a distance from where they were spawned. And then I'll show you this in a second. They have a really unusual hunting mode, which is unlike the hunting mode of any of the native predators in the Atlantic. That probably gives them an advantage as well. So we started working um, on lionfish in about 2007 or so 
after a student of mine who spent a field season in the Bahamas came back and said, did you know those reefs are covered in lionfish? And I went, you gotta be crazy. Because lionfish are from the Indo-Pacific. What are they doing in the Bahamas? And she said, no, really, really, there's a lot. So we got on a West jet plane, <laughs> flew to the Bahamas, and uh, I discovered that she wasn't actually lying. She wasn't hallucinating. There were lots of lionfish there. Lionfish have not hit the headlines yet. Um, the other thing that I discovered that was, makes studying lionfish in the Bahamas particularly cool is that the Bahamas still has all their apex predators. <laughs> so, you watch lionfish and there's big shadows kind of swimming above you, which is good to concentrate the mind. <laughs> okay, so what did we discover? Well, the first thing we discovered was that virtually nothing was known about lionfish because in the Indo-Pacific they are unremarkable. They are not a very abundant component of the fish assemblages there and there were very, very few studies. We knew nothing about lionfish. So we started um, doing comparisons between the native range and the introduced range. Um, so at the time I had a student, Emily Darling, who was working in Kenya. She was doing an experiment where she was had to essentially watch coral grow. That doesn't monopolize all your time. And she said, I'm bored, what should I do? I said, go count some lionfish. So she did. We had devised a method to survey lionfish in the Bahamas. And so she used the same method and counted lionfish and measured them and so on. So we came up with the first comparison of lionfish in their native range and in the introduced range. And you see the results here. This is density. You can, you can see that in the native range in Kenya, most of the reefs have very few lionfish. You can compare that to the density that they reach in the Bahamas. So the averages are at the end. Blue's for the native range. Red is for the introduced range. And in terms of density, at this time, we saw about five times the abundance of lionfish on uh, the Bahamas reefs than in Kenya. We also found out that lionfish grow much bigger in the introduced range. So in terms of length, they're about 50% longer. In terms of weight, they're about three times the weight. Um, so that if you put these two measures together, density and uh, body mass, you end up with um, a biomass in the introduced range that's about 13 times higher than in the native range. Okay, so these are invasive species. Now you're going to see how a lionfish is. Okay, I must preface this. I'll do you know the sound. I did not throw the goby into that tank. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. This is a, um, a tank that was um, at a dive operator that was meant to entertain um, divers. So the goby got, got thrown in there. And you can see this young lionfish is now staring at this goby. And this lionfish <laughs> is showing a very, very typical hunting um, behavior of lionfish. And this is that, this behavior I was telling you, is unlike anything that um, the native fish are experiencing. So the lionfish flare out, they're very feathery, um, pectoral fins like this. They adopt a head down position, so their head is very, very close to the substrate, staring at their prey. Their body is almost immobile, held in position with just faint movement of the tail and of the uh, dorsal and uh, anal fins. Sometimes they blow jets of water to s almost to align the prey very well. And you keep your eye on this fish. Right, that's a mistake. Oh. Okay. So as soon as the prey, which to a certain point, um, starts exhibiting movement, then that's it. It's confirmation that the prey is indeed a prey. And as you saw, it, this is like a vacuum cleaner. It just sucks the prey in. It's fast, and it happens hundreds, thousands of times every hour on Caribbean. So, with a student of mine that spent a long, long time watching this happen. Now, if any of you ever spent time watching fish underwater, you probably can count on the fingers of one hand often you saw predation in the wild. 
You just don't see predation in the wild unless you're watching lionfish. <laughs> then you see lots of predation in the wild. So um, in many, many hours of watching lionfish, we were able to quantify how successful they are. So on the whole, you know, three quarters roughly of their predation attempts are successful. And we're actually able to quantify a predation rate of about 1.5 prey per hour. So this is actually huge. We discovered um, all sorts of quirky things as well about their behavior, such as the fact that they really don't like hunting when it's sunny. So we did observations when it was really overcast and observations when it was sunny. And um, when the sun comes out, both their hunting time and their general activity, um, the distance that they move, goes way down. Which probably reflects the fact that they tend to be crepuscular. Okay, so these are daytime observations, but when the um, clouds cover the sun, it's almost like you're at dawn or dusk, and then they go, whew, hunting time. Now they hunt, they eat virtually every, any, everything and anything. Uh, this is a fairly typical um, inside view of a lionfish. This thing here, uh, I believe this is it, or maybe this is it, um, is a layer of fat. So these fish actually put down fat, which, I mean, I've looked at enough fish inside, you rarely see literally layers of fat around the body walls. <laughs> just packing in the fat, which probably, probably explains why they can't starve them. But anyways, um, the other thing you'll notice is that some of these prey here you can uh, probably identify if you know your Caribbean fish, but most of them you can't because they're fairly heavily digested. So we found this kind of troublesome because we wanted to know exactly what species they were eating. And we thought, wouldn't it be cool to have a gizmo like this? Who knows what this is? <coughs> now, given this talk, oh, have you seen this talk before? No. Oh, good. What is it? It's the original tricorder. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've given this talk probably 20 times, and the first time somebody knew what that was was the last time I gave it in California. So congratulations, you're the second person who knows <laughs> that this is a tricorder. <laughs> and if you remember, uh, in Star Trek, Mr. Spock had a tricorder, he kind of went to a new planet. He would, you know, pick out like a bit of leaf from a tree or something and stick it in there and the tricorder would say, oh, this is this species and he could put it in this. And we thought, man, what we need is a tricorder to put all these unidentified bits of fish in the machine so we would say, what species it is. Well, actually, I almost, it was almost like meeting Mr. Spock when I met somebody who works at the barcoding lab in, at University of Guelph. And he said, yeah, we can do that. The so barcoding is this um, DNA technique whereby you sequence a very small part of a particular gene that tends to be completely conserved within species, but variable from species to species. As long as in the um, DNA bank there is the species that you're looking for, you can sequence your bit of unidentified fish and then match it up to a known sequence that belongs to a known species. And et voila, you have your species identified. So that's what we did. We sent a whole bunch of fish bits that we couldn't identify to the uh, DNA lab. So from these samples, we we're able to identify only about a quarter of species um, visually. We sent a bunch of bits to the DNA lab, and literally, this is the best bit of field work I've ever done. Because about two weeks later, an Excel spreadsheet got sent back to me <laughs> with 64% of these DNA bits identified to species. Like, we had a really, really good picture now of what lionfish eat. So, that egg, or whatever that shape is called, that represents the 39 species that up until that point had been visually recognized in a very large survey of more than a thousand lionfish stomachs. We only looked at about 10 percent of that, but with DNA barcoding, we found 37 species, almost the same number of, fit, of prey. There was a lot of overlap between the two. But we discovered 16 species that people didn't know lionfish ate because we were able to identify them by barcoding. So at that point, the 
total number of fish played was about 56. It's probably well over 70 now, which is a really high proportion of the fish that are available to lionfish. Some of the new uh, prey species that we discovered with barcoding, I mean, you probably have to agree that we, we should be excused for not being able to identify these because they're like squitty brown uh, species, like these things. Mm -hmm. But some of them we should probably have picked up because they've got funny shapes like flatfish or funky colors and characteristic body sizes. But the most amazing species that we found in the stomach of lionfish was lionfish. So we established the first evidence of cannibalism. Unfortunately, that really doesn't happen often enough to hope that they're just going to eat themselves out of the Atlantic, um, unfortunately. Um, so with this kind of information, we are also in a great position to be able to start identifying the characteristics of prey that make them particularly vulnerable to um, lionfish predation. And these are six characteristics of fish prey that make them really, really good for lionfish. Um, if you're small, you're cigar shaped, you're solitary, you live on the bottom or very close to the bottom, you don't clean parasites off other fish, and you tend to have a nocturnal lifestyle. All those characteristics are found, well, some are found in various combinations in fish like juvenile parrotfish and basslets and so on. And interestingly, the same combination of characteristics turned out to be important whether we were simply comparing what lionfish were eating in visual observations compared to what was available to them when they were hunting or when we were comparing what they had in the stomach to what was available to them on the reef scale. So on these two scales, the same characteristics popped out as um, characteristics of uh, preferred lionfish prey. And species that have all six of these characteristics <coughs> are 200 times more likely to be eaten by lionfish than species that don't have any of these characteristics. So, we have a, a fairly generalist species um, that still, though, exhibits certain preferences in relation to the characteristics of their prey. So, moving on to impact. I had a PhD student, the first PhD student I put on the lionfish system was Stephanie Green, who is at UBC, but not here at the moment. Um, so, Steph, the main thing Steph did uh, for her PhD was to try to quantify the impact <laughs> of lionfish. And she did this by working in New Providence and surveying a bunch of different reefs. And her general approach was conceptually simple. Um, we figured that if she could estimate prey fish production, so how fast the prey are sort of replacing themselves, and take away from that lionfish prey consumption, you'd end up with net prey fish production. Okay, so conceptually, that's easy. It was rather interesting to populate the P and the C here, uh, but she was able to do that, uh, largely doing uh, field surveys, using the behavioral observations uh, that we, um, that we all did, and figuring out how to convert standing biomass of fish into uh, production rate. And she did that using um, established relationships from metabolic um, theory. But in general, we figured that if N stayed positive, so if it was above zero, then prey fish production exceeded lionfish consumption, and things would be okay. okay? So N above zero indicates sustainable predation. So Steph calculated production and consumption across a bunch of different reefs, and these are the results. So this zero here is the point at which production and lionfish consumption uh, balance each other out. Okay? So this reef over here is doing okay. <laughs> the rest of them, not so much. Okay? So for the rest of the reefs, lionfish are basically consuming the production um, the faster rate, at a faster rate than the fish can replace themselves. And just to put things in context, those, that bunch of reefs that are sitting over there would need to double, the prey would need to double their production to meet the consumption by lionfish. 
If you go a little bit further down, you need to quadruple the production to bring those reefs to the zero bar. And that core reef down here would need 12 times the current production. Okay? So lionfish on most of the reefs that we studied are actually overeating their prey. Now, this is obviously <coughs> modeled. Um, if this is true, then we should see obvious declines in prey abundance. And indeed, that's what we see. So we did the same surveys at the same sites in 2008 and 2010, and this is what happened. So on average, there's over just over those two years, there was a 65% decline in prey biomass. So how do we deal with the lionfish invasion? Well, the cows obviously have an idea. Um, you can eat them. They actually taste really, really good. <laughs> and in fact, people are encouraging that. So there's a couple lionfish uh, cookbooks that have been uh, published. And encouraging, though, a lionfish fishery is a little bit tricky because in many countries, um, when the official government position is to open or encourage a fishery, then there's also an associate re associated requirement to make that exploitation sustainable. And that's not what you want to do when you're exploiting an invasive species. You want to drive them into the ground. So in the US, for example, even though the reefs in Florida are overrun with lionfish, the official position is, uh, well, to say nothing. <laughs> now, for the talk, we thought that perhaps groupers, native groupers, large-bodied um, predators were the solution. Um, a PhD student of mine who was working on groupers um, discovered lionfish, young lionfish, in the stomach of groupers. Published a little note about this, and a, a lot of people jumped on this, saying, yay, recover groupers, we have a solution to the lionfish problem. And in fact, um, another research group working elsewhere in the Bahamas published this relationship that relates uh, lionfish biomass to grouper biomass and suggested that groupers were indeed the solution because when you've got lots of groupers, you don't have a lot of lionfish. This didn't quite jive with um, the feeling that myself and some of my colleagues who work elsewhere in the Caribbean um, had about the relationship between groupers and lionfish. So what we did was to pool our data and to ask, well, on a bigger scale than just this little Bahamian island, do we see the same relationship? And this is what we found. So. No. Okay, groupers are not liking the solution. You need to recover them, but for a different reason. So, the only way to catch lionfish is this way. Okay? You can't drag nets because they live on coral. You can't um, hook and line them. They just don't go for that. They will go into trap, but they swim out again. They're very clever. So the only way to catch them is to cull them one by one using steering. And as far as I know, I don't know if we've ever kind of run anything to near extinction doing that, but we're trying now. Um, so Stephanie did a big field experiment to figure out whether culling like this and reducing lionfish densities could help us recover populations of native fish. So she did a very big experiment where we moved the operation to Eleuthera, and she had a set of reefs and four different treatments. So on some of the reefs, she did a full removal of all the lionfish. On some of the reefs, she used that very same model of production and consumption to guide her towards a certain amount of removal that would be likely to be enough to recover the native fish. And then she had another treatment where the removals were likely not to be quite enough and then another step that was a full control where there were no removals at all. This experiment ran for two years with removals being done every three months roughly. Okay, so a long experiment. So what you're gonna see here is the change in prey biomass, okay? When you've got your four treatments here. So the two sets of treatments closer to me are those treatments where the model had predicted that we were removing enough lionfish to recover or at least stop the decline of our native fish population. So we'd expect to be around zero here 
or positive, which would mean a recovery of native fish populations. And the two treatments on the other side of that vertical line, we predicted those would not be enough in terms of removal and that um, prey populations would continue to go down. And here are the results. Okay. So we like the means. The means are exactly where they're supposed to be, which is good because it suggested that with removal, individual removal like this as a strategy, we could actually recover or at least stop the decline of native fish population. This was interesting though because we see a lot of variability um, among reefs here. And we also see that this treatment, the yellow treatment here, where some of the lionfish were, were left behind, was as effective as removing all of the lionfish. Now we actually took this as being good news for managers because getting at those very last lionfish when you're trying to remove everything on a reef is really hard. Really, really hard. So we did another little study to try to understand why it's so difficult to remove those last few lionfish. So we did a, um, we tried to understand vigilance in lionfish. So we had divers approach a lionfish like this. And as soon as the lionfish showed evidence of vigilance, <coughs> and with lionfish it's not sort of swimming quickly into the coral. With lionfish it's actually turning towards the diver and sort of spreading their venomous dorsal. It's a, it's a very kind of antagonistic posture. It's not a being kind of fish. Um, as soon as the diver saw this behavior, the diver dropped a little weight, and then another diver measured the distance between the lionfish that showed that evidence of recognition of danger and the uh, position of the diver. So what we ended up finding is that on those reefs where we've been culling lionfish repeatedly, but usually leaving, leaving a few behind, their alert distance was significantly higher. Okay, so they were reacting to the presence of divers from a farther distance. Okay. We also discovered that on those same reefs where we hunted lionfish but left some behind, um, that those remaining lionfish hid. Even during the day, they hid really deep into the reef, such that if we were trying to um, hunt them, they would be much, much harder to get than reefs, than the lionfish on reefs where we've never hunted them. <coughs> so it looks like this continuous hunting actually shifts their behavior and makes them more difficult to hunt, which might explain why it's so difficult to get that very last lionfish on a reef. The other thing that complicates management a bit is that lionfish move around. So I had a PhD student, Natasha Tamburello, who um, tried to understand lionfish movement, and she discovered that they move a fair bit. She compared patch reefs to continuous reefs and found that on patch reefs, they tend to stay put, but when they move, they move very, very long distances, up to 800 meters at a go. Whereas on, continu on continuous reefs, um, they don't move nearly as far, but they move small distances more often. And Natasha was able to build a metapopulation model based on these um, movement distances, which kind of inform what happens when you try to manage a patch. So this is just an example of one of our outputs. If we clear a patch completely of lionfish here, we can actually figure out, knowing what we know about movement, the effect of effectively removing that patch from the network of patches the effect of that on the density of lionfish at other patches. So we end up finding that if you remove all lionfish from a patch, then that changes the densities of lionfish on other patches. And sometimes it's really strange. It ends up producing very counterintuitive results. Um, so because lionfish move, it means that this culling it has to be done in a certain way to maximize the um, or to limit the rate of recolonization of cleared patches. So that's what we've learned so far. And we're doing a lot more that still focuses a bit on management, um, but now also focuses on the indirect impacts 
that lionfish are having, largely through their, um, their predation. So I have a PhD student who's looking at how lionfish are affecting the flow of energy through trophic levels on patches. Um, we're looking at the process of herbivory on coral reefs and how that's affected given the um, prey preferences of lionfish. We're looking also at whether uh, at our site, which has now been invaded for more than a decade, so for small fish that's possibly up to 10 generations, whether we've seen the evolution of predator recognition, because we know that at the start, the native fish did not simply not recognize lionfish as predators. But I'm just going to mention a little bit more about two of our ongoing projects. One project is the effect of lionfish on nutrient cycling, and another one is on the effect of lionfish on reef soundscapes. Now Fiona Francis is another PhD student of mine who is writing up right now and producing lots of results. I'm not going to show you results, um, but just tell you what she's doing. Um, on coral, coral reefs, um, coral reefs exist in very nutrient poor water. And on reef patches, much of the nitrogen and phosphorus that ends up on the reef and is used by corals and algae is deposited there through the excretion by fish, essentially fish pee. And <coughs> this cloud of pee is used by primary producers on the reef, but also um, by seagrass, which usually form halos around reef patches. So this is what, there is a certain sort of baseline nutrient budget um, caused by fish excre excretion. Now what happens when lionfish comes into the system, starts munching our little pea factories, how does that affect the nutrient budget? Always. Obviously, they're taking pee out by uh, eating nutrients, but they're putting pee in through themselves. So do these two things actually balance one another? So Fiona has spent a lot of time catching fish and essentially doing this. <laughs> catching little fish, putting them in bags, waiting for them to pee, and then figuring out exactly what their phosphorus and nitrogen contribution is per unit size of fish, per unit time. <coughs> putting lionfish in bags as well, which is rather challenging. Uh, and she's just about at this stage now when she, where she can build this nutrient budget to try and understand what's happening on our reefs that have lots of lionfish and reefs that have very few lionfish. I think this is a really, really cool project looking into indirect impacts of lionfish. The other thing that we did just this, um, this past field season was probably some of the most fun field work I've done in my entire life. And when I invited Sophie and Brendan Nedelec, two British uh, researchers that specialize in uh, underwater acoustics, I had no idea that <laughs> this project was going to have me have spend the entire life, the entire night, swimming <laughs> pitch darkness, recording sounds. But that's what we did. So I have no idea whether this is going to work. But let's try. I just want you to listen carefully. It's a tiny sound of what reefs sound like at night. Oh, I did turn my sound off. Yes. Wait. jet engine, but we're not that close to them. And we probably couldn't hear that 
um, on this clip, but there's also low grunting sounds that are um, made by fish, usually grunts, at night. Um, so when you're really quiet on the boat, you hear it all. It's continuous all the time. And this reef sound is actually really, really important because it's a major cue for larval fish and larval invertebrates um, to attract them towards reefs. Okay? And lots of other people have, uh, we're just unraveling this uh, generally, and we now know or seem to know that better quality reef tend to be louder. So our question was, when you have lionfish on a reef, does it actually affect the quality of the sound, and can it affect the decisions that the young fish make as to where they go and settle? So what we did is we recorded lots of he what we call healthy reef sounds, so the sound of reefs where there are very few lionfish, and then we recorded the sound of reefs where there's lots of lionfish. And we created loops and played this back and put little tiny, tiny fish in these chambers where they could decide to go right or left towards the healthy sound or towards the lionfish infested sound. And I can't tell you <laughs> what the answer is because we're analyzing the result right now, but, but, but it actually looks, just without statistics, it looks like most of them are going a healthy reef sound, which is really, really cool. Anyways, that's what we've discovered over the past seven or eight years working online. Thank you. sidebar to that particular question and it's the fact that a year or so ago people in Australia in the native range of lionfish did a predator recognition experiment that involved lionfish and a number of other predators including another lionfish that's in a different genus from ours um, and the native prey fish there recognized the other predators and the other lionfish, but not pterodactyl spotted tongues. So even in the native range, it looked like native fish did not recognize it. So I think they, they didn't behave in a way that suggested recognition. I'll just say though that pterodactyl spotted tongues is exceedingly rare in Australia. Um, so we're we're in the Caribbean. These fish are exerting a selective pressure that is just not comparable to what they're exerting in the, the, uh, in the native range. So I'm kind of hoping that, I'm hoping, yeah. Um, hi, my question is about the aquarium trade as a vector for introduced species. Um, I worked in an aquarium store for many years as a teenager, and one of the things that, one of the stores that I worked at um, that was happening is that we would clean the tanks with the, you know, the big siphon. Um, and this would involve cleaning tanks that have live rocks from the Indo Pacific, uh, sand and gravel from the Indo Pacific, fishes, macroalgae, clean them, put the water in a really big 44 gallon trash can, yeah. take it outside, dump it in the oven. Yeah. Yeah. Has anybody looked at that? <laughs> no, um, I think unless you have lionfish in there, it's really unlikely that the invasion started with eggs because nobody's actually been able to breed them in the lab. Um, well, what about other species? Oh, other species. Yeah, that's possible. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, what's keeping them in check in the Pacific? Have you considered introducing some natural enemies here? Oh, gosh. No, that's not in the <laughs> <laughs> um, Well, it just seems like it's a pretty bad situation right now. So I'm just it, is, it is a bad situation, and um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of money has been put at trying to understand what keeps them in check in the native range. The tricky thing, though, is it's really hard to find a site where you can study them in the native range because they're so rare there. Um, so of the comparisons that have come out, the, 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 I guess the most promising one is that lionfish seem to have 
fewer parasites. At, at least in the Atlantic, they have fewer parasites than the native these are predators. Um, and they have fewer parasites than they do at home, like in their native range. So, so the, they probably did not bring the full complement of parasites into the Atlantic that they have. Having said this, uh, my guess is that parasites are not the only thing that's keeping them in check in the native range. Um, but what it is exactly? I mean, there's obviously um, you know predator diversity. Certainly, diversity is higher, abundance not necessarily higher in the native range. Um, so, so there are differences, but at the end of the day, we have a comparison of one. So I think it's going to be difficult to establish. They apparently, I got an email two days ago from somebody working in the Mediterranean where lionfish went through the uh, Suez Canal um, about 100 years ago, or 75 years ago, about 100 years ago. But they've been confined to uh, the Israeli coast. But in the past two years, they've started expanding west. And now they're kind of worried. So if that happens, then, then we have an end of two. <laughs> Maybe. I was going to reference that work oh. Chase in the right. Mediterranean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just wondering what happens to the lionfish and, and the reefs where the crayfish are crashing. Um, like the, the Sorry, what happens to the lionfish? In those reefs you studied where the crayfish decline, do they, do they switch prey or do they, they decline do. as well? They do. They okay. do. Yeah, so when we first got there, it's about seven, six, seven, eight years ago, they used to have about 18 to 90 percent fish in their diet. Now they're down to about 50 percent, and the rest of it is made up with by invertebrates. And the invertebrates are so hard to survey that we'll never get to their full impact on invertebrates. <coughs> yeah. So I was wondering, um, have you noticed that there is increased predation rates on lionfish? Just because I'm assuming that if you have um, dropping prey populations, then the other predators are also suffering, right? So do they switch to eating more lionfish to compensate for that loss? No, not really. Um, and, and surprisingly, the issue of competition with native the predators has been really, really difficult to show. Um, so a couple of people have tried, and I think the evidence is, I mean, the, intuitively, you'd say, well, they're eating the same stuff, and lionfish are you know, causing decline, so the, the native mesopredators should suffer. But um, so. I, Body size for body size, it's really hard to show that they're suffering. Uh, and I think nobody nobody's really shown an increase in predation rate on lionfish, although lots of people are trying to train large groupers and train sharks to eat lionfish, which has its own set of issues <laughs> associated with it. Not the least is that you know sharks that are fed lionfish then expect every diver to feed them something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of the Caribbean reefs had densities that were comparable to the native range. But is are those reefs that are just being colonized, or is there something about the features of those reefs that can explain that comparable density? Yeah. So the at least when I okay I don't know about the uh, the Kenyan reefs. Know that the, that lionfish density on um, on the Bahamian reefs is largely controlled uh, in part abiotically by the complexity of the reef substrate, uh, in part by the production rate of the prey. So the production, the total production of prey obviously varies with prey density, and those reefs that have or had in the past higher prey density had more lionfish. So there's, there's a pretty tight correlation. I'm um, just wondering about in your in your culling study. Um, I, do you think that the the re one of the reasons why there wasn't a difference between your like getting rid of almost all of them and getting rid of all of them is just because they're reinvaded so quickly those patches? Uh, they are reinvaded, but not that quickly. Okay. Uh, and the reinvasion is something that we're looking at, and we're we're starting to understand pretty well the, the characteristics of reef patches that are make them prone to reinvasion. Um, it, it's, it varies a lot from patch to patch, depending on where a patch is in the network of other <coughs> patches and how close it is to, say, a, a, a large continuous reef, which is a source of lionfish. Yeah. 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 Ye
One more question. Um, have you also looked at uh, changing biomass of um, roofers? Because I'm assuming that if there is a competition between lionfish and roofers or the top river species, then if lionfish are stronger in uh, prey, then there must be a line of other species. Yeah. So when when we documented the decline in prey biomass over those two years, we also looked at a number of other explanations beyond lionfish predation, and one of them was uh, an increase in predation by native um, groupers and other predators. Uh, in fact, the biomass of groupers over that two-year period has actually gone down, but we can't assign that directly to lionfish predation because we fished as well. So there's an element of fishing, probably, probably most of it is due to fishing. Well, let's thank this